Welcome back to the third week of Reclaiming Our Stories, Four Remarkable Zen Women. This week I'm going to talk about a historical Zen figure named Miu Tetsuma and her modern contemporary. I'm going to use their story to talk to you about just being who we are and authenticity. Yu Tetsuma was a woman who practiced in China in the 1100s. She appears in some of the Zen koans. Now, koan is a kind of a, a story of one of the ancient Zen masters that's sort of like a riddle, but a riddle that we can't answer with our conceptual mind. So it's meant to help us sort of unlock our thinking mind and really uh, learn from the experience. So Yu Tetsuma appears in a Zen koan. Koans are intended to um, share stories with us about the Zen masters to inspire us. Through this inspiration, we can model our own practice on theirs. The thing is, most of these Zen stories are about men. So then the stories teach us what's really a male ideal. So this koan stood out for me because it's about a woman, something I, I experienced very rarely, and her name was Yutetsuma. You know, we make the assumption that all of the ancestors are male, but the thing is, the names, from the names, we don't know if they were male or female. Why do we make that assumption? So anyway, Yutetsuma-san was from the 1100s. Her teacher was Isan. She was known for her strength, for her playfulness, for her determination and practice. She lived near one of the Zen monasteries. We don't know exactly why she lived there. I mean, did she happen to live in the neighborhood anyway? Or maybe she would have been a nun if she was able. Or maybe she lived there on purpose so that she could be near the monastery. So we can decide on an outcome or we can stay open to the possibilities. The colons don't state her age, but she's always called the old buffalo woman. I don't know why. The footnotes say it's a term of affection. We don't know if she was old. We can make that assumption or we could stay open to the possibilities. Her name, Niu Tetsuma, means the iron grinder, like a kind of for sharpening tools, grinding. And a lot of the commentators say it's because she liked to grind up men with her wit and her, her uh, Dharma combat. We do know that Niu Tetsuma was quite strong and there might be some truth to that or perhaps it's just a name. It does seem to fit with her personality though. I'd like to share with you one of the koans that talk about Nutetsuma. It's called Nutetsuma, the old female buffalo. It's from the Blue Cliff Record, case number 24, and it goes like this. Nutetsuma came to Isan, and Isan said, Old oh, buffalo woman, you've come, Tetsuma said. Tomorrow, there's going to be a great festival at Taisan Mountain. Are you going to go? Isan lay down, stretched himself out. Tetsuma turned and left. The end. So that's the koan. You can see it doesn't make much sense. But the, 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 the crux here is that Taisan Mountain was 600 miles away. So in 12th century China, it might have been a challenge for Isan to go there the next day. So this is a koan teaching us about time and space. You can get a good sense of her character from it, the playfulness, the wit. When I was working on this koan, my teacher told me that Kanahira-san, the caretaker for Kanonji, our temple in the north of Japan, was named this. Her teacher, Tetsugu Ban Roshi, gave her the name Ryu Tetsuma, when she took lay precepts. When I heard this, I was deeply touched. Kanihira-san is in her 90s now. She's the caretaker for Kanonji, the temple in the north, because my teacher has another temple where he spends a lot of his time, so she helps him to care for it. She was a disciple of Ban Roshi, my teacher's teacher, and she took on care of the temple out of devotion to him. She gets up every morning, rings the wake-up bell, goes to morning zazen meditation, goes to morning service, 
cleans the temple, makes the breakfast. She takes care of the temple. She lives like a nun. She once showed me her foot. The outside of her ankle is all shiny and kind of almost calloused from sitting in the lotus position so much. Kanehita san never ordained, but continued her devoted practice as a lay person in the temple. So you can see the similarities between her and the historical figure. When I first met Kanehira san over 20 years ago, it was during Sashin. Then we reconnected just before my ordination years later. My teacher decided to drive up to Kananji from his other temple and I went with him. And as we approached the temple, he turned and he said to me, um, by the way, I didn't tell her we're coming. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? And he said, well, uh, you know, the thing is, uh, she's a tiger by which he meant her Chinese zodiac year, by which he meant it, she's strong. And she is. Kanehira san has a fierce wit. She doesn't suffer fools. She's a very dedicated practitioner, but I, I learned that my teacher's kind of scared of her. She, um, she respects him greatly but she doesn't indulge him. And in many ways, she's kind of like his mom, which I find very touching. Kanehira sounds a lot of fun. You kind of, you have to stay on her good side, which you can do by giving her sweets and by being authentic because she hates nothing more than people who are fake. In other words, Kanehira sounds pretty similar to the description of Nutetsuma that we get from the koan. And again, this is why I was so touched that her teacher gave her this name. It's because he sees her. He really saw her for who she is. He wasn't asking her to be something else, some maybe some kind of a, a more girly type of Japanese woman, but just recognized her for who she is, this very strong, straight speaking Japanese woman. And he appreciated and even celebrated her as such by naming her that way. And I can hardly think of it without tearing up. Most women practitioners get names like gentle heart or pure truth or compassionate wisdom, but not her. She's the iron grinder, a tiger. Kanehira sounds pretty private, so I won't share all of her story here, but we do know enough from her story to know that there were probably some unpleasant parts of it. She has a son, and her husband left pretty soon after the son was born. She worked for many years in the post office, and she came to practice in her 40s through Ban Tetsugu, her teacher. She practiced diligently with him and continued on staying on as the caretaker of the temple after he died and when my teacher took over. Kanihira san has no temple ranking. Like she's not in the temple, she's not in the temple hierarchy in any way. But she has a lot of strength and she's the one who keeps the place going. She also has a lot of humility. The thing I want to say here is that we are who we are. And that's all. All we can do is to let our Buddha nature shine as we are, as women, not a male ideal of who we are as women, but just as who we are. In her case, this very strong woman. In other cases, maybe a very quiet woman or even a very feminine woman. The only choice that we have is to be who we are. My teacher says the ideal practitioner should be neither male nor female. And he cites Kanon Bodhisattva as an example. Kanon is the Bodhisattva of compassion. And when you look at the, the figures of Kanon Bodhisattva, you do see neither male nor female. The thing is, male practitioners often interpret androgynous as male. And this is because we're out of balance. 
When we're out of balance, things are skewed one way. For example, in the monastery, when you have mostly men, what becomes seen as normal, as the center, is actually male. And this is how it goes. Because the more male is seen as normal, the less normal female seems. And then in turn, the less welcome feminine energy is and actual women are. In Japan, the monastic lifestyle can be very male. During the times when I practiced together with men, it was sometimes suffocating. I've even had a man say to me that only men can be enlightened. And he believed it. As long as we think practice is about becoming somebody else, we'll never be able to allow our Buddha nature to shine. We'll never be able to be who we really are as women, as men, as, as anyone. Practice is about taking the backward step and shining the light within. In the koan tradition, when we practice with koans, we read these stories of these practitioners and we're expected to become them, to really try on and, and literally become who they are. So, you know, as I shared with you, most of the stories about men are about men. So I, I do this all the time. But in the case of Dutetsuma, I have never read a commentary on her that I think really gets who she is as a woman. We get a male perception of this woman, this old buffalo woman. We don't get a female perception from the inside out. And I think this is a failing. This is what happens when we're out of balance. So by bringing in women's stories, we can start to rebalance. If these men had a chance to practice with women, or even a woman teacher, as many men in the, the West have the chance to practice with, they would have noticed being out of balance. And if they didn't notice it, then their teacher would have pointed it out to them. This is the benefit of having women in practice. This body that we're born with is what we have to work with in this lifetime. So it's not about becoming somebody else in order to reach perfection. It's about finding perfection in what we already have. And likewise, we have to accept others exactly as they are in their place. My first Zen teacher used to say to us when we would, you know, complain about something somebody was doing, it's okay, that's just their place. Give them some space. Let them be in their place. In this lifetime, in this body, my place is female. And this is what I want you to understand, that we don't need external validation to be who we are. We can let our genuine Buddha nature shine, even in situations where we don't have balance, where we're not equal. Nobody gets to tell us who we have to be. We have to find that for ourselves. Sometimes in those situations, we can even sort of fly under the radar because we're not noticed so much and have a little bit more freedom to figure out who we are. I once practiced in a Zen temple where the teacher just couldn't accept me for who I am, as I am. They would tell me things like, if you could only do this, then you would be happy. Usually the this was be more like me. And I ingested that. I tried really hard. Oh, maybe if, if I do this, then I'll be doing it the right way. But the thing is, I, there was no possibility of me ever doing it the right way because I was trying to be like her. And that wasn't me. And when this happens, it can become a pattern and it can start to consume us. It becomes like a cancer that eats us from inside out. It's insatiable, it has no end, and it's a trap. 
because we can never become anything other than who we are. The Zen master Uchiyama Roshi used to tell a story about a violet and a rose. His teacher was very strong and he compared him to a rose, really vibrant, and heavy. And he himself was weaker in body and more intellectually inclined. And he thought of himself as more like a violet. And what he would say is, a rose can only become a rose and a violet can only become a violet. For a violet, there's absolutely no need to produce rose blossoms. A violet is beautiful, whole and complete, just as it is as a violet. And a rose is beautiful, whole, and complete, just as it is as a rose. We can only become our own best selves, intricately connected with every other being in the universe, loving and caring for each other. If Kanahira-san had tried to become this sort of feminine, very girly Japanese woman, she might have succeeded. But at what cost? She would have been an imitation of somebody else, not who she was. She would have been miserable. But she found her way to her teacher who recognized and celebrated her for who she truly is. A tiger and a sea of monks, strong, playful, vibrant, the iron grinder. And this is what I want for all of you to allow your own Buddha nature to shine forth, to use your practice as a support, to let go of the extra, and to let your genuine nature be what it is. This is the way. This week we talked about Yutetsuma and Kanehira-san and the quality of being genuine and being who we truly are. Next week we're gonna talk about Maura Soshin O'Halloran, a young Irish American woman who went to Japan, became ordained, practiced like her head was on fire, and was enlightened. <laughs>